Good morning. Why am I looking side? Oh, I know why I'm looking sideways. Aha, uh -huh. you have to turn your neck. <laughs> oh, hey, you know what? It's a beautiful thing to have two monitors where you can move the mouse and everything. But uh, it is a great morning here in B Cube Sunday morning. It's B Cube Sunday brunch. And that means that we have either got Karen or Brenda or Phyllis or Joyce um, running the show. And then they have their uh, um, guest of choice. And today's guest is the Stephen King. Um, you actually um, on writing uh, winner, right? That's correct. Yep. Stephen King on writing is one of my favorite books on writing. I think it is a spectacular uh, book. It ranks right up there with the 10% solution. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think both are excellent. So, uh, Jack, we have Jack here and uh, Brenda. <coughs> Brenda and uh, so, Brenda, what are you and Jack going to talk about today? I'm sincerely hoping that Jack will tell us all about his fiction, both the uh, the novels and his new short story collection coming out, uh, and uh, um, uh, so that we can all know about it. Uh, I admit that, you know, because I'm from the East Coast, I actually, oh, look who's here, look who's here. Uh, maybe Karen will show up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then, and Karen, of course, uh, Karen actually has is more familiar with your work than I am, Jack, because uh, I'm uh, the number of things I have not read in this genre is just frightening. I read recently that uh, when I was a girl, it was expected that science fiction, uh, er, er, you could read everything on that had ever been uh, published in your this calendar year easily and it has been many a decade since you could do that and so the number of things i have not kept up with is very very large Hello, yeah i read somebody gardner or somebody talked about that once but that back in the 50s and part of the 60s anyway you could certainly keep up with everything right but that's obviously impossible now yeah even if you like do subsets like i i don't read horror i don't read movie tie-ins you know mm -hmm. and even if you peel out everything related to marvel comics it's still overwhelming you cannot keep up yeah no i get it yeah now can you are can you be, hear us karen can you hear we hear you well can you hear me all right because i i came in using the wrong browser because i absolutely mm. could not get in on the other browser so um, do I sound all right to you? Yes. You do. Thank you have goodness. a little bit of a Belgian accent, though, I've noticed. <laughs> well, good. I'm if glad you, you're here. If you hear a strange squeaking noise, it's my mm -hmm. new kitten. Well, wow. you have to grab us and show us the kitten at, at an opportune moment. <clears throat> sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't get the kitten going. Oh, okay. All right. We yes. wondered whether you were not showing up because your new kitten, the kitten arrived in Karen's mm. life yesterday, whether the kitten was hanging from the chandelier or had gotten into the guts of the dishwasher or had beaten up the you're, dog or something. You're you know. actually going, you're going to see the kitten because in the far back of my screen, there is a screen door and you will see mm -hmm. the kitten go up the screen door. Oh, great. That's really good for the screen. Yeah. No, no, it's a special sure. kitten screen. Oh, very good. There are special kitten screens. Ooh, they sell them on Amazon. They're Designed for the cat to actually for... climb up. And that's great. Jack, they also work really well for small dogs. Uh, anything, you know, <laughs> short of a pit bull, they're Velcroed to your door with very strong Velcro. Uh -huh. And the, the animal cannot get out. Well, really? our dog is supposed to be a lot smaller than he is. He's like 15 pounds and he's a chihuahua. Whoa. So a large dog. Although he doesn't look, I mean, it's only when you take into consideration that he is a chihuahua and should weigh about six pounds. But uh, he was oversized from the beginning. Very cute, though. They believe that they are actually, you know, German shepherds. Even though they're chihuahuas, they have the heart and the belief 
that they are much, much bigger than they are. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's accurate. Small, all well, small dogs like that. Our our kitten is kind of undersized, so she's yeah she's just really, 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 really tiny. So. Yeah. Yes, and she is a disabled or or a handicapped kitten. I oh, no. I saw the. Uh, she doesn't uh, know it though. So no, no, but you know it. it. There's going to be the, the. How did she lose her <laughs> eye? Infection. She she was she was thrown or abandoned out in a field in um, Adams County, and some people who had just happened to be employees of an animal rescue shelter saw her oh. out on the highway. And she came oh running God. over to them and they took pictures. Her tail is up in the air and she's dashing over and she's a totally friendly cat and they got her cleaned up, but she did, it did cost her the eye. Yeah. So, oh my God. Yeah. Okay. She's just uh, so I think we have to not ball. talk about the kitty for a little while. Wait, when she appears, <laughs> yes. we will interrupt. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, Jack, tell well, us the name of your book that's coming out. I'm going to key it in here for Bob. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, the book is coming out in November, November um, 6th or 7th, is uh, called The Whole Mess and Other Stories. And it's a collection of most of the short fiction I published since the last collection, which was Are You There? That goes back to, uh, that one came out in 2009, I think. Um, so there's, there's 18 stories. The first collection had 26, I think. This one has fewer stories, but they're tend to be a little bit longer. Um, the book also contains a, a nice introduction by my friend, Daryl Gregory. And um, I've written a lengthy, maybe even too lengthy uh, essay for the back of the book um, called The Writing Life. And it's uh, it just traces my little journey to becoming a published writer, starting back in, um, 1981 and this was an interesting thing to me at least so I thought I would write it out and it's the it's the longest piece of nonfiction I've written um, and I just thought I would do kind of a timeline because I, I, I wrote for just about 21 years before I published anything and I started when I was 25 26 years old so I thought I'm gonna just write this out maybe it'll be inspiring you know that like that that kind of um, stick to itiveness and all that but i wrote a version of it and it just it wasn't adding up to me for some reason and i just thought it, it seemed more like a like i was writing about somebody else like my wife nancy she talks about my story sometimes as being tortured lonely guy stories so it was like i was writing about that guy who isn't actually a real person and um, so I got out all my boxes of old manuscripts and rejection letters and correspondence and notebooks and all this stuff that I was keeping to put together a timeline to see where I'd gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And I discovered something really interesting, at least to me, which was that I completely misremembered this whole thing. And I'd been oh, telling myself and other people a version of this story of how I became a writer and um, it wasn't actually accurate and I this fascinated me like why am I why would I misremember some of this stuff and why would I put it that way so this essay takes the form of um, kind of an investigation where I just start at the beginning with what sort of launched me I go back a little bit like to childhood and then I, I jump forward Mm -hmm. And um, what I actually did, what my intent was, and um, how I got to where I got to eventually. And it, I like this because it was a 21-year uh, road trip to my first publication at Asimov's. And then this book is coming out 21 years after I've been publishing professionally. So it, it, it's a nice balance. 21 years. Wow. Right. You're really the you're really analog mafia. <laughs> yeah. Well, I <clears throat> the conclusion I came to in my famous essay as I like to call it <laughs> is that um I the way I presented it because it did take so long was that um 
because of stuff that happened in my childhood and kind of some trauma and stuff that uh, I was particularly averse to rejection and had difficulty focusing and concentrating. So the way the way I told the story to myself was, well, it took so long because I'd write a I'd write a story and I'd, I'd pick up one or two rejections and then I'd find that too painful and I'd put it aside and then I'd write a novel and I'd go back and forth like this. Um, essentially telling sort of a victim narrative about this whole thing. And my conclusion at the end of this essay was that I'd been kind of embarrassed by how long it took. Once I started publishing and meeting all my, you know, new friends in the publishing world and doing all this, I, I realized my journey was a lot longer than most of theirs. And I didn't understand it. And it kind of embarrassed me. So I had all this stuff, but going back and looking at my, um, all these novels and, and rejections and all this stuff that I did over the years, uh, I discovered that the person I used to be was very determined and I made a, a series of very deliberate choices, <clears throat> excuse me, that sort of cornered me to the point that when I was in my early forties, I was really out of options as far as <clears throat> going back to school and, and starting a real profession or something because I designed my whole life to be a writer. And at some point I, I figured out that I'm not going to make much money at this or you could, I mean, I have made some money, but after, you know, a decade or so, it dawns on you that you're probably not going to, it's probably not going to be that thing that we all fantasize about where the giant checks start rolling in and all this stuff. So why do you, why do you keep going? What's the, what's the motivation for writing at its mm -hmm. core? Um, what, what does it give you that nothing else gives you or any, any art form that you practice if you're mm -hmm. a, a musician or a painter or something and, um, how, how this affects your psychology, the way you see the world and, and more importantly, the way you see yourself in the world, how do you, uh, negotiate that and kind of keep rolling and what, what do you need to let go of and what do you need to, to hang on to? in order to fi finally get like over the threshold to that next door. And I talk about all kinds of stuff related to uh, the writing life and the, the, the factors that like luck actually does play a part. You have to land on the right desk at the right time and all this stuff. Um, I was struck by reading these uh, rejection letters and uh, correspondence with agents and everything and uh, short story market people that I was so close so many times, uh, like early on, very early on, like with the first story I sent out, I was getting these um, handwritten notes and letters and stuff, and you're almost there and all this stuff. And yet somehow it just rolled on and on <laughs> and on and on. And the way I like to put it in this essay is that because luck is part of it, perseverance mm -hmm. is another big part of it. But you have to you have to play the long game, mm -hmm. and outlast the bad luck aspect of it, and you have to work really hard and keep pushing and keep trying, even when you know you just feel like it's hopeless. Because I think a lot of a lot of writers, a lot of new writers or any writers, they get derailed and sidetracked by the by the rejections. And my experience with that is it's partly because you're focusing too much on um, factors that you can't control. Mm -hmm. Like I can't control if somebody buys my story or one of those several novels that I wrote back then. All you can do is the work and these intrusive thoughts and desires for publication can actually stultify your your uh, work. It wasn't. It wasn't until I kind of gave up on all expectations that I started writing better. I was writing all right to begin with, but giving up on this these preconceived expectations about it uh, freed me up. There's a mind game to writing. I've I try to tell mm -hmm. young writers that you have to have your head. What, what Terry Pratchett would call headology. 
You have to have mm -hmm. your head in the right space. Otherwise, you can cripple yourself. And I think that's more well known in the performative arts, you know, like actors and dancers know that if you don't have your head in the right space, it, the performance does not come off properly. All right. That self-consciousness is, yes. is, is, is terrible. Or, or just like yeah. you say, this whole, this whole thing back here, you know, you should be like George R. R. Martin. You should be able to make, you know, I don't know how much George makes, but some disgusting sum. You're At least thousands of neither dollars. Neither am I, you know, <laughs> but it is, Jack, it I, is. Oh, go ahead. I want, as, as you did this new collection, Obviously, mm -hmm. you're comparing it in some ways to your first collection. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit of talk about how the world has changed between those two collections, how your worldview has changed, and how your writing has changed. Really, you write very dark stories, and we're living in an increasingly dystopian time. How has your mm -hmm. writing about these, these brooding characters that you have, who are often in a... <laughs> <laughs> you you write what I would call hopeful stories in apocalyptic settings. How right. has this changed over the past forty years? Um, let's see. Well, so the stories in "Are You There"? That's a that's a fair description. Um, they are a lot of tortured, lonely guys. It's not just that, but there's quite a bit of that stuff. And I think part of it is you you find out, you, it can take you a long time to find out um, what you can most effectively tell the truth about. And that was one of my big themes. And a lot of the stories that I wrote that got rejected prior to that, um, I feel like I was standing outside of um, my own experience. I was telling stories in the way that you would tell a story about something, but kind of from a distance. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, um, I wasn't getting too personal about it. And that, you know, people do that kind of writing and it can be very good and entertaining and interesting, but the, another type of writer, which I apparently am for the most part, at least in short fiction, it ha I have to get at the deeper concerns in my own you know, mind. And for whatever reasons, um, a lot of that stuff was darker. And But tapping into that was like tapping into a power source. Mm -hmm. And I worked that theme pretty, pretty heavily for quite a while. The difference between the Are You There stories and the stories in the whole mess, or at least Daryl tells me this, and I believe them, and it's, it's kind of it's kind of true. They're more optimistic, in general. Um, people in in the previous set of stories, one of a, one of the criticisms was that I'd sometimes slide into a happy or upbeat ending or something at the last second, like it was sort of tacked on. I didn't do that very often in the stories I collected in that book, but. I did do it sometimes, so I felt like it was a little unrelenting. And in these stories, my people are finding each other, and um, or as Daryl puts it, um, characters discover that they need a co-pilot, you know, <laughs> to get through life, that kind of thing. Um, so there is, I do, I really do think there's a difference between these two, these two collections. Um, yeah, go ahead. I think I think Nancy is unfair saying you write about about lonely guys. I think that you also <laughs> write about lonely, angry women. You write fabulous women characters, particularly in some of the stuff. I think it was for Clark's World um, that that oh, I yeah. read. Was, yeah. Um, has your approach to writing about women changed, especially as women's roles in society and the military and stuff have changed a lot? I mean, um, you're, you're writing in a time of enormous political change. Yeah, and I try to, I try, like to keep back from that a little bit because when you when you write specifically about your times, um, you're also dating yourself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like if you'll go back and read people's work from the 1960s, that that decade, a lot of it. It just, it's a little clunky. 
because it's so wrapped up it's so wrapped up in the social changes and everything that's going on uh, so I, I try to avoid topical stuff but it'll seep in from the sides in, in sort of an oblique way um, most of my stories are pretty tightly personal type stories so I think I can get away with that a little bit more um, I've always been able to write about women I don't know why um, I, I I don't know that I'm particularly good at it, but I do. I have gotten a lot of good response. I've written whole novels from female perspective. I enjoy it. I think I think some writers have more trouble with that, but I think it's it, it's maybe a matter of um, you know how we're all like I'm a man, but I a, a lot of my viewpoint and and feelings and thinking go kind of in a female direction. And I think I have a, a different kind of empathy than say somebody like um, whoever, Harlan Ellison or somebody. So I don't have, I, I, don't have tr I don't have a lot of trouble seeing things from a female perspective. And I enjoy writing from that perspective. At Chaos Function, the, my last novel, the whole thing was written from um, a female journalist. I'd been reading about the war in Syria and two of the best books about that were written by um, female war, war journalists. One Correspondent. Family, correspondents, right. And um, I just found their story so compelling. And the balance they were doing, uh, one, one of these uh, correspondents was um, married and had children back in Italy. And here she was in these horrific war zones and I I was really interested in the um, psychology of that and how she balanced it out um, in this collection there's I don't know there's a number of stories from female perspectives it's sort of a balance is now in, do you have any stories in the collection that have not appeared anywhere else I have one um, everything else everything has been published in ma major venues from Asimov's to uh, Clark's World and Lightspeed and, you know, the usual places, except one story called, and now I'm going to make myself into a liar because I just said I don't get involved. Yes. I try to stay away from it. I was leading you but, into that deliberately. But there, there, there is a story called The President's Drone. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. And it got, it was rejected around a couple of times, and then I just kind of put it aside, and then I rewrote it you know, for this collection. And um, it gets a little bit political. Mm -hmm. And I, I I'd originally written it um, in the midst of um, the first wave of political chaos back in, you know, 2015, 16, all that. And I was struck by how the country was so divided you know, into red and blue states and all this stuff. It had always been red and blue, but it just seemed like in the last decade, it's worse. Almost like it's almost like open warfare. Mm -hmm. And and when I wrote this story, that was kind of a far fetched idea, which I think is slightly less far fetched. So this was a, kind of a post apocalyptic thing where basically the red and blue states have gone to war against each other, and um, the president's drone is a automated device that sort of wanders around you know the remnants of the united states and it's it's broken it was it was meant to do stump speeches at uh you know small towns across america and it would project a holograph of the president and all this stuff but now it's just wandering through poisoned you know empty town squares and giving stump speeches and that was my starting point for that and I think the story is hilarious when I reread it. I was laughing out loud and and I tweaked it up a little bit and you know cleaned up the sentences and stuff. So I think I'm just gonna put it in for something new. So there, there's Jeff, the, there's this totally resonates with the B, B cubed writers, a lot of whom have written in that vein at least one story. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted it to be sort of bitter funny, and I think it I think it is. There's three new things in this in this book, but only one new piece of fiction, which is the president's drone, and then there's um, my essay and mm -hmm. Daryl's introduction. 
This is Daryl Schweitzer, am I right? No, Daryl Gregory. There, okay. Yeah, uh, there's a couple of Daryls rolling around here. Just want to be sure that we have the right one. Yeah. Now, Daryl's a very good writer. Um, uh -huh. He published Spoonbenders a few years ago. He's won the World Fantasy Award and Shirley uh -huh. Jackson and everything. He's really good. Good. And he's a friend. He's been a good friend since we met um, in Tempe, uh -huh. Arizona, back in 20, 2006, when the Nebula Awards were there. Uh -huh. That was a big watershed. So, speaking of the drone, yeah, what I was reading of your stuff, there were a lot of there was AI going on. There were lots of of AI robots. There was the assassins, where you've got the whole world or most of the world playing this game using these special glasses and projecting, losing themselves. And that you wrote that back in like. You probably wrote it in like 2016, 2017, and we really have ended up in these immersive games. Um, that one really interested me because you had a woman who, if she's not a villain, she's at least a woman doing really, really bad, ill-advised things. Right. Simone the Slayer. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> yeah. That story, um, I'd been trying to write a story with my friend Bert Cortier. That's a co-written story. Since we were in college... And back then, in the the one and only creative writing class I ever took was in a junior, junior college back in 1975 or whenever it was. And Bert and I were in that class, and he was just a much better writer than I was. I really, I thought, really good. And uh, he never published any fiction, and I was pretty terrible back then. And I couldn't, I couldn't see a future without being a writer. And he had a lot of trouble with the uncertainty of it all. Mm -hmm. I remember the first story he sent out, it was a story written in that class, and it, it went to um, Ed Furman at FNSF. Mm -hmm. And Ed rejected it, but with a letter saying, well, if, you, if you could kind of lower the humor quotient in this story and bring up the serious elements and all this stuff, I'd take another look at it. And he didn't do it. And I asked him years later, because I didn't know this at the time, but many years later, he said, well, I, I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and so he was a he was a, a terrific, intuitive writer. But uh, he didn't have the experience at the, that time to understand how to do that stuff. And it took me many, many years, I think, to get to his level of writing and then be able to um, pull this off. So that this story that we're talking about assassins um we kept trying to write a story together for like decades and we'd start something and our styles wouldn't really mesh and then the thing would just dribble off and we just couldn't accomplish it and then back whenever this was 2016 or so mm -hmm. I thought, well i'm a pro i mean i've published all this stuff and novels and everything it's now or never so I got back with him. He lives down in San Francisco or down in Los Angeles. And um, we took another stab at it. And this time it worked. And even Nancy threw in a, 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 an idea for doing these little um, italicized vignettes to kind of fill the story out. And uh, I'm really happy with that story. And we finally, we finally got it done. It was Gardner picked it up for his last edition of the year's best science fiction. So mm -hmm. that that made me happy. It got translated um, into Chinese for their big magazine over there. So that that was a very successful little story, and it only took about I don't know forty years to write. Yeah. Um. Yeah. What else you got? <laughs> She has well, a list of questions. Talk to me. I don't really have a list of questions. I sort of have oh, okay. a list of stories that brought up ideas. Oh, sure. Yeah, go um, ahead. So I've been reading Stephen Levy's amazing article in Wired about what AI is, what it isn't, why it does what it does, and how mm -hmm. it grows and modifies. And mm -hmm. you got into a lot of the AI stuff in Salvage Opportunity. 
Oh yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it <laughs> salvage, salvage opportunity has a man who's stranded with a an AI companion, and they be the the relationship becomes very fraught <clears throat> because the man begins to resent the robot's capabilities. This is actually a theme that I work in. Are you there? To the actual story, are you there? In that story, uh, a uh, police detective recovers this module from a serial killer that he's been walking around with, and it was basically contained the personality of the killer's mother. It wasn't her, but it was this idea. It was this idea that for all intents and purposes, it seemed like her. She would commute, talk to this guy and they would have communication and she knew what she was, which was, you know, a device. She, mm -hmm. It wasn't actually herself, but it didn't matter because to, to her, she was, was real. And this guy who had a lot of, he was a tortured, lonely guy, of course, he had a lot of trouble connecting with people. So he connects with this person, um, this personality and falls in love with her, knowing that he's essentially talking to himself. And I thought, well, this is interesting. At, I wrote it at that story at the time when um, um, communicating in chat rooms and all this stuff was was big, mm -hmm. beginning to get really get rolling. So in the story you're referencing, Salvage Opportunity, which I think is also a very funny story. It's serious, but there's it's kind of funny. It's it's um, Daryl talks about it in the introduction has it. It could be it could be a piece where if it were an actor, it'd be one actor on stage playing three parts or three actors playing the same part because this guy he's not really stranded on this planet, but he's signed up to be there to have a human presence so that they can claim salvage rights to this thing if they eventually get around to it. But he's by himself and his companion is a um, interactive personality uh, with a female presentation that's based on his own um, engrams. So he's essentially, it has a personality and everything, but he's essentially communicating with himself and that's why they get along so well. And the, and at some point in the story, the um, the companion feels that he he's too alone in this place, and it it takes a a piece of its um, artificial intelligence and kind of impregnates a uh, android that's in this gigantic spaceship that they're there to salvage. And the, the, the conceit with the ship that it crashed was that it was a a colony ship the uh the actual colonizers existed as you know, frozen embryos that would, would once the planet once the ship reaches the planet they would be raised by these androids until they could take care of themselves so the, the em embryos are all destroyed in the crash but the androids are could be functional so the companion enters one of these androids and walks over to the habitat so now we have three characters who are essentially the same person with slightly different um, personality presentations. And it's really a, a solipistic um, story. And it is, it's, it's, I think it's, I think it's funny and I think it's, um, it's uh, got heart and it's a little bit brutal. It's about loneliness and, and, um, being able to connect or fail to connect and and understanding you know what the problem is so it's i like that story quite a bit it struck me as being a lot about the way that we sabotage ourselves right yeah 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 right up to the end of that story but that one he's a tortured lonely guy but he eventually asked if he can come in kind of you know can i come home basically so that was that was that thematic twist that i'm doing in a lot of these stories where my people um realize that they're too self-involved and have to come 
come forward and seek other people. Another story like that in the same collection was um, the sum of her expectations. And this time my tortured lonely guy is a tortured lonely woman. And she finds herself marooned on a planet and um, interacting with these nano builders who were left by the race that abandoned this world. Mm -hmm. And um, the nano builders are continually constructing things for her. And um, she finds herself basically being infantilized by living in her childhood room and all this stuff. And she has all these stuff from the past, but um, that also works that theme pretty good. And it's a longer story. And uh, I mean, I'm making these stories sound like they're, there's some sort of a slog, but I, I, I think they're pretty entertaining and they're, they're fast moving and um, I'm a sentence guy. So I, I really keep things rolling with this stuff. And I try to come up with new ways of expressing uh, common observations. It, it strikes me that most of your stories could not have been <clears throat> written 50 years ago. They're very, very much, I see people in them reacting against both social and technological problems that we currently, all of us live with. Your people are just right. a slightly more dramatic it's, version. It sounds it. so COVID, you know, we're all isolated uh -huh. because of viruses right. and interacting only online or, you know, with, with messenger or texting or whatever. And that's all you get. Uh, yeah. No, I just written a book about, um, how isolated we are, you know, people can die and they find the bodies three years later mm -hmm. because essentially it, you know, you, people didn't even realize that you weren't showing up on your chat rooms or whatever, because bots were carrying that on. And yeah. you can just, your, your actual meat, the actual physical you can vanish and all this stuff can carry on sort of without you. I think that we're living in the kind of the aftermath of, of um, a lot of the stuff we had to do for COVID. Mm -hmm. And it's both, it's both, the technology has been both good and bad, mm -hmm. pre-COVID, during COVID and after COVID. Because this type of um, communication, this type of interaction with other people, it's, um, it's obviously very different from human interaction, being in the same room, um, having that human experience. This is, this is like a remove, you know, the way we're always looking at screens on our phones and laptops and the rest of it. I mean, this isn't a great insight or anything, but I do think it, 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 it can fool, it can fool us into thinking that we're not isolated when we actually are. And if you're, especially like a kid, like a teenager, I, I thank God I didn't have this technology when I was in school or even when I was traveling, when I, I really would have wanted it. Like I went off to Maine when I was um, 25 years old to become a writer. And I, that was pretty isolating back then. I mean, there were no cell phones or anything, certainly no computers. So I wrote a lot of paper letters. And then once in a while, I would go over to this uh, kind of a diner pizza shop and they had a pay phone and I called collect like a friend or a relative back home in Seattle and just to talk to somebody that I knew because I was a person who tended to isolate anyway and now being in you know about as far away as, from Seattle as I could get where I didn't know anybody and I didn't have a job initially and all that stuff it was pretty isolating but also when it's like that then you you really are where you are I've noticed um, that a lot of the traveling Nancy and I have done since we've gotten married, we've gone to Europe a few times and China and all over the place. Wherever you are, you're also here because you always have your phone. You always have, you know, your laptop. You can always, you're just a click away or a swipe away from this familiar world, mm -hmm. you know, electronic world. And my feeling is it's both convenient and it also undercuts um the experience of travel because you're never completely away from your home environment. And I, I think we're never going to go back to this, but I, I think of my brother when he, he went to Europe um, when he was studying art at the university of Washington and he, 
he's, they, he went with a class and then stayed over for like six months with a rail pass and traveled around. And back then, he would schedule a call by paper letter, and then we get the trunk line and everything. Everybody gather around, <laughs> around the phone. So he was like going to Europe. You know, that was would have been the 1960s. Um, you were far away, and it mm -hmm. it felt like it on both ends of that equation. And but I've been in, you know, I've been in um, small towns in France. I've been in Rome, just talking and texting to people back home without any difficulty at all. And uh, maybe it's just a personal thing, but it t I liked it. But at the same time, it took my attention off the otherness of where I was. And maybe I didn't get the full experience. I mean, we're all welcome to get the full experience by turning off our phones, but uh, who does that? No one ever does, you know. No. It is. I think uh, one of the real, the, the one of the real joys of reading Jack's stories mm -hmm. is that they take place in very quiet places. Mm -hmm. um, assassins had a lot of people around, but a lot of them have people alone in offices, have people alone in spacecrafts, people wandering planets alone. And it's kind <laughs> of a refreshing, vicarious experience of being somewhere where the character can actually hear themselves think. Well, a lot of my stories are, um, could almost be done as a two character play two character, one act play. Sometimes I'll even imagine it that way. Or I, who was it? I think Tim Powers was talking about writing process a long time ago. And he said something about writing his people as though they're on a bare stage mm -hmm. to get the story, just to get the dialogue and what, what's going on with the characters and then go back and fill it in at layer upon layer upon layer until you'd have these, these magnificent, um, complex novels. I always thought that was pretty interesting. Um, wow, yeah. I am more comfortable it generally, especially in short fiction, I'm more comfortable with, uh, you know, one, two, three character plays. Because it's a short story is, you know, basically about one or two things mm -hmm. in a short space of time. And uh, it's hard to expand that. And if you, if you push too hard to expand that, um, it's not working as a short story. Then you, you have to move into novella or, or novel territory. I find that some ideas sort of want to be short and you can't, it's, it's as if you're building too big a house with too small a foundation. Mm -hmm. Some buildings are just meant to be, you know, cottages or sheds out back, you know, workshops out back. They're not meant to be mansions. So it's well, a I, different architecture. I know with, a lot of people used to, I don't know if this is still the case, they would think of short stories as their uh, stepping stone to get to writing mm -hmm. novels. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I kind of thought that way in the beginning too, but after long uh, years of doing this, I, I, I fully understand the, the difficulty of writing well at short length. And it's, mm -hmm. in some ways it's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. In the novel, you have so much elbow room to move around. And I think, Writers have a, they have um, a form they're most comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And some write, ideally, you can move back and forth. Like somebody like Stephen King writes a bunch of novels and he writes the short story mm -hmm. and stuff. But some people are primary, primarily short story writers. There's a who, lot of uh, people who are, you know, it, I think Harlan Ellison may, wrote one novel and it it wasn't his best work. He was better with short stories. Right, he did that rock rock kind of a rock novel better. yeah and there is a uh uh the when i tell young writers that it's like horses you know some horses are bred to run a certain race mm -hmm. so if you are bred to run the kentucky derby three quarters of a mile uh you're not going to do well in a steeplechase where you have to run 20 miles and so right. yeah. you just have to you have to sort of find your best length and, you know, maybe you have a couple lengths and that's good, but you should find, you know, the first thing you do when you're starting out is you find the easiest length for you to work at. And you mm -hmm. sort of mind that one because you're, that's the race you're born to run. Well, I know that um, the crime writer, John D. McDonald, mm -hmm. talked about this. When he got back from the war, he decided he was going to take a stab at being a writer. Mm -hmm. And um, he decided to write short stories 
because he could do a lot of them in the same amount of time it would take him to write a novel mm -hmm. and he could learn the craft that way. So that's, that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that for a while now, I've been writing novels. I have a couple out on submission right now with my agent. And so now I've try, I'm trying to go back and do some more short stories. I have this idea. I wanna, I want, I'd like to publish 50 short stories and I got like five more to go. <laughs> I mean, I'll do more than that, but I wanna, I wanna at least get to, I, I just like that number. And, um, but I haven't written a short story for quite a while, for a few years. And it's such a different mindset that um, it's, I don't just fall back into it because I, I trained my mind over the last several years to think in novelistic terms. And mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time writing and rewriting and editing and getting people to look at these books. Going back to the short form, it's just, it's like a switch. Mm -hmm. And if it's gone, if it's been long enough time, you don't just fall back into it. I'll find myself, oh, this is a good idea. And I'll, I'll write like four or five pages of it. And then I realize if this is a short story, I should be about a third of the way through. And I'm just at the beginning. So I'm still, my, my writing chops are still kind of directed at something much longer. So I'm trying to um, dial that back a little bit and get back into doing short fiction it's interesting I, i'm curious because you 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 done you did the chaos function that mm -hmm. came out in 2019 mm -hmm. and what it, what are you working now on now is it all short fiction no since then i've actually written a couple novels uh they haven't sold yet um i did one that was a, really a pretty direct follow-up in that type of novel called extinction tactics and um I think it's pretty good. It's still out there. It went to uh, now Harper Collins. It was originally Chaos Function was published by uh, Houghton Mifflin, which was then absorbed by Harper Collins in the meantime. And um, they had just published, just published a novel with sort of a, a similar conceit, with a different angle on it. But they didn't want to take another novel with the, the same, you know, thing that that soon. So that one's bopping around. Then I wrote another book uh, that's more of a fantasy, contemporary fantasy called uh, Ghost Miles. It's about truck drivers who uh, deliver this mysterious cargo once a year to, um, well, I don't wanna give that away. <laughs> but I was using this idea, I was using this idea that the interstate, the interstate highway system was actually laid out over a sort of ley lines uh -huh. driving over these these um highways and these old 40s and 50s trucks they activate this thing and the, the idea is in 1963 uh nuclear armageddon actually did occur due to the bay of, the um cuban missile crisis because it, it should have but it didn't and the thing that's holding it off is this it's sort of a pact with the devil kind of thing. But he wants his due. So once a year, he gets his cargo delivered and it's, it's kind of unsavory. And, and then I have a I have two oh. characters. I have, an, I have an older guy that's kind of like me who was, was recruited as a driver back in the day, figured out what they were doing and opted out of it and then spent pretty much the rest of his life um, you drinking and keeping away from everything and isolating. And then the other character is a young woman about 20, 25 years old, who is the new generation of drivers who found herself in the same situation he was in and, but wouldn't tolerate it, even though breaking this pact seems to invite that Armageddon to resurge and just, overtake us the the thing that they're doing is so egregious that you can't do it she couldn't do it morally and these two characters come together and uh attempt to dismantle Ooh. the situation that one i just finished that one pretty recently and my agent is shopping it around now but you know that's exciting yeah i know Yeah. 
Um, so that's what I've been doing. Then I'm going back to, uh, I, it used to take me a long time. I once spent five years writing a novel back in the uh, 80s or 90s. In fact, I wrote, I think I figured it out, I wrote something like eight novels before the 2000s when I sold Harbinger. And um, I talk all about those in my famous uh, writing life as <laughs> say. Jeff, do you do any teaching? I've done some. It doesn't come naturally to me. Um, I did a little teaching with Nancy because it, she's really good at it. So mm -hmm. we did a clarion thing once. And um, for a few years running, we did um, this thing in the Bahamas with Shahid Mahmood um, of Ark Manor. He would get a bunch of writers and students would pay to go on these cruises to the Bahamas and it would be like a teaching cruise. So I, I, I did that for, we did that. For that sounds years. rough. Pretty rough. Um, I really, I, but I don't know what kind of a teacher I turned out to be, but uh, I really like going to the Bahamas every year. It, it was in December. So yeah. <laughs> we would go back to New York where Nancy's father used to live and um, it'd be all wintry and freezing cold. And then like the next day we're down in Florida and, you know, like I was fascinated that within like a 24 hour period or so we could go from like Buffalo frozen in Buffalo to like sitting around on, on the deck of a ship in the, you know, 80 degree weather down in the Bahamas. It was really interesting. What's awful is when you go back in those shorts, uh, I've seen people get off the plane at Logan and they yeah. were still dressed as they were in Nassau and it was a nasty, <laughs> nasty shock. Yeah. In February, you know? I think, I, I'm trying to remember now, I th we would get back, it would go, there'd be like a week cruise and we'd teach classes and then the boat would pull into port and everybody would get off and do their thing, you know, and then come back. I think we'd spend, when we got back to Miami, we'd spend one day in Miami to get organized. So we weren't getting on boats in our Bermuda shorts or airplanes in our Bermuda shorts or anything like that. But, um, that was an interesting you know, experience. A hundred years ago, something like that would never have happened. People would never have had that sort of experience, certainly not the average person. And no, it's not. I keep thinking about in a hundred years, what will be the experiences that people will have that we can't imagine now? Yeah, um, just just the thing we've been able to do for so long now, which is air travel, mm -hmm. is pretty miraculous when you think about it. I mean, I never used to travel very much at all. I just didn't have any money. And then in the last um, last 15 years or so, I've done a lot of traveling all over the world. And it's it's really interesting to me. And we just got back from, we spent nine days in New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, we were staying in uh, Nancy's sister's, Nancy's sister's boyfriend's <laughs> apartment in Hell's Kitchen, because they were off doing a play in um, Connecticut or Vermont. And it was just great living in the city and so completely different. And um, I was just, I was really struck by it, like this gigantic megalopolis and we're out walking around every day and going to the different boroughs and all this stuff. We did a reading over in Brooklyn and um, it was so noisy. This apartment was right above the street on 49th street, right down from, oh, yeah. right down from 8th Avenue. That's not, and, that's not so great a uh, neighborhood. They call it Hell's Kitchen for a reason. Oh, I didn't mind it. I mean, it's, oh, it's nice a little now. rough around the edges, but it was really, yeah. I liked how uh, vibrant it was. Yeah. And like two two or three blocks over on 40, 46th Street was like Restaurant Row. Right. And, and you're in the theater. Bars and restaurants and the theater the district theater. was right up around right. the corner and Times Square and all that stuff. It was a real interesting experience. And then we get on a plane and there's the discomfort of, you know, flying for five or six hours. And we're back here and it's just dead silence by comparison. Mm -hmm. Like we'd sleep with the window open and it's all night long, sirens and 
people talking and shouting and cars honking and, and everything. And it didn't bother me at all. And then we get home and it's comparatively, it's like being in a soundproof chamber. Even, I mean, we're not right in the middle of Seattle, but we're in, we're in West Seattle down by the beach. And it, it's just so quiet that at first I had trouble falling asleep because I wanted all the noise again. Once you got used to it, it's like, it was like uh, white noise, background noise. Mm -hmm. uh, you you remember, had me thinking about, and go ahead, go ahead, Brad. I was going to say, I, uh, uh, you remind me that, you know, even, even in our lifetime, travel took a lot longer. Airplanes took a lot mm -hmm. longer. Uh, uh, I've been writing some stuff set in the, uh, around in the 1950s and 60s and there was a time when you couldn't make the jump across the Pacific in one flight. There's no Seattle to Tokyo flight. Right. You had to stop in Hawaii or Guam mm -hmm. or something to gas up. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it really, really, and those planes are so slow, you know, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, slowly cutting through the air. They didn't have the speed that Boeing has contrived for our airplanes. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it is astonishing that how the world in some sense has shrunk. Uh, yeah. that and the, the all this online stuff, you know, in theory, there's nowhere you can't see now. You hop onto Google Earth and let's go, you know. Uh, uh, I know, and it, it's it's seductive and and uh, useful for writers, especially. Oh, absolutely. But I I do think it it could be doing some damage to us as a society and uh, mentally because it's. It's the addictive nature, especially of our smartphones. Mm -hmm. And that's a design feature. And um, one thing I've noticed that people who are just it, are incessantly posting on social media, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it seems to me that you're, you're almost living your real life online and I don't know what's going on in the background, but I've I've seen my own addictive tendencies with the phone and social media and stuff. So I, I made a, a very deliberate effort to uh, cut that off. I didn't think I was I didn't think I was benefiting to the extent that I was to the balancing extent that I was uh, suffering from it. Just in a, it has a time sink, has a, this idea that. You're constantly, um, you're constantly stimulated by. Um, or you're constantly neg on negative show, stuff, you know. You know, or you're constantly on show. This, yeah. it's. Uh, it I'm seems taking. Sort of, I mean, it's not like an old guy, but it, it does seem sort of unnatural to mm -hmm. kind of be preening or setting up pictures of yourself constantly, or you you can't go some. You're not really someplace unless you've got the right picture to to prove it or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was. I'm always shocked when. When I, I've gone somewhere with people to what I thought was kind of a private experience, and yeah. suddenly they're posting <laughs> pictures of this all over the internet, and I'm like, really? It's, <laughs> well, it's, and it's, it's everybody. Scary. I, you know, going to movies um, out to the theater, mm -hmm. it's all the cell phones and everything. But but when we were in New York, we went to a couple of plays on Broadway, and it was the same freaking thing, <laughs> except the people were generally as a general proposition we're a little older at a, at a broadway play maybe because they just cost so much money but up before the play started everybody has their phones out yeah I, could, I would look around i mean i'm not you know on my high horse like i'm immune or anything i just if if i'm driving i put the phone in my pocket if i'm in a theater i turn it off you know immediately but I look around, all these people like my age or a little bit younger, sometimes older, they're like going through their phone and then they go to the next thing and they go to the next thing. And you, you could see it. It's almost painful to put it down. And now the lights are dimming and everything. I'm thinking, is this going to be like uh, the movie theater where there's going to be all these little lights all over? <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, not. But I, you could really see the addictive nature of it. Mm -hmm. And kind of interesting to me and and um a little scary because we're we're continually getting input and a lot of it is negative i think because that piques your interest if there's some sort of controversy or fight or something like that and it's too much input i don't think we're really designed for that 
our host is warning us that we're very close to closing time. Oh, okay. So, I, Jack, I want to thank you for coming and telling us about the new book, which mm -hmm. sounds wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to reading that collection and, and, and reading about the president's drone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I hope you enjoy thank it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I think Bob's going to yeah, chat us is. out now. <laughs> okay, Bob. Bob. I see his muted. lips moving. I see the lips moving, but I don't hear any sound. Right, me neither. Oh, there right. you go. There okay. You go, Bob. No, I did. It just uh. So, Karen, is your cat still asleep? I saw her tail Toby going by in the back. No, mm. that was Toby. Uh, oh. There is a uh, uh, for our viewers. Karen has a new kitten who arrived yesterday, and uh, is dominating her life. As they will. I can believe that. Much like Nancy is dominating our chess games right now. <laughs> I'm sure she's happy about that. Oh, huh? do we see a kitty? Yes, we see a oh, kitty. There it is. Well, oh, it's a cat. It's a baby cat. <laughs> What's the name? Know. What's the cat's name? Her name is her name is Anne Bonnie after the famous female pirate. Oh. It, it's because she's a one-eyed kitty. Oh, no that's I, can't can't. Any. <laughs> I told you guys a story in the comment like section about my one-eyed cat I had once. Yeah. 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 They can they can survive it at that, you know, surprisingly well. It doesn't bother them, you know, as long as they don't have a uh, medical issue, you know, they they adapt perfectly. Well, this one, I mean, I was more amazed that it survived the uh, transformer uh, electrocution of that the blew out an eye and a leg. Uh, uh -huh. Wow. But he was a, always a little off, but that was lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Jack, anything you want to add? Um, are we still are we still streaming? Yeah. Oh, we're still yeah. screaming. I thought we were, a final I thought word. We exited the theater. Um, we're very uh, yeah. Buy my book. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Are you going to be at World Fantasy or uh, you're not going to WorldCon? I'm going to assume in China because if you were, you'd probably be gearing up. No, we're not going to go to China. Dan's been a two or three times. I went the one time, and we just decided to. It's far. To that give that one a pass um we are going to we're not going to world fantasy either mm -hmm. we're doing well, i've been doing some book promotion and then nan, nan had a book out um earlier in the year observer mm -hmm. so we did this reading in new york and um in a few weeks we're going down to san francisco and going to do a thing down there and then we're doing a reading here in Seattle at the University Bookstore in November when the book will actually be out. Um, next year at Worldcon, we may or may not go. I really want to go because it's Scotland. I like to go. Mm -hmm. We yeah. also have a, a friend of ours is having a, her um, 70th birthday. And I guess she's renting this big place up in Maine mm -hmm. and have we got an invite, so we, we really want to do that, and it's kind of in that time frame. So it would be a matter of flying to, to Scotland and then coming back and doing that or vice versa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, problems ensue because we have this little dog. And we don't want to leave him too long. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would just say that if anybody out there is – you know, aspiring to write professionally or whatever, you need to uh, just keep at it. I mean, I, I'm really into this thing about playing the long game. And I, I've encountered a lot of young writers who are seem to be kind of devastated by the, the process of rejection. And I just always say, you know, even after you're publishing, you get rejected. It's just, it's part of the process and you have to, um, you have to learn how to negotiate that. And don't take it personally. You can't help it. I take it personally. I don't want to, but you know, you do. But you still, you have to, at least in your public 
presentation, you can't take it personally. I will see people, I don't know if it's so much now because I'm, I'm not on social media as much as I used to be, but I used to see uh, writers kind of excoriating the editor who rejected them. And I'm thinking, uh, you, should, you know, everybody sees this stuff. You're not like in a private room and you should have a, you should have a friend who understands what you're doing and then you go you go to the bar the coffee shop or whatever and complain about it and you can say whatever you want but don't say it online and it's that, it, the internet is forever away. you know they'll fish that thing out when you're you know you accept your nobel prize for literature someone will fish out that stupid post you made they'll in 2021 it. right yeah embarrassing yeah no i agree um but stick to it i mean Part of the part of the reason I stuck with my famous uh, writing essay was that I wanted something out there that um, newer writers or people aspiring to this business would could look at and see. Okay, so I'm going through something kind of similar to this, or here's a guy that got to the point where he just wanted to quit and couldn't really couldn't really manage that and it's not the end of the world and there, there's always another hill you can get over you just have to stick with it and you know bring your best game now on that topic two weeks ago three weeks ago we had a writer named mark tufo on. Mm -hmm. now a lot of people have no idea who mark tufo is mm -hmm. other than the fact that he's got seven successful series sold over a million books and uh lives up in maine um mm. and uh he's just a, a great writer and mm. he's a very human character i mean what i love about him is in his books when the uh, uh ex-marine or former marine you know tough guy that he's writing about because mark is a former marine mm -hmm. uh, when he's shooting his M16, sometimes the barrel overheats, you know, when he's, uh, sometimes he runs out of ammunition. Uh, sometimes he's got a, uh, 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 cleanliness phobia. He writes human characters. Mm -hmm. So here he is. He has put out, written a couple of self-published books and he's walking down to talks to his wife and he says, I'm done. This just isn't working. I'm pulling the books. We're spending, it's just too much work. And then he went upstairs <clears throat> to do that. And there was an email on there from a fan who told him just how good his books were and how much he loved them. And, and then he's fine. Uh, yeah. And uh, mm. he went back downstairs and said well let's keep it up for a bit <laughs> and like i said today you can look up mark tufo t-u-f-o mm -hmm. uh, he sold like i said well over a million books highly successful uh lots of different series and he's just a good writer and he's mm. glad he didn't quit and i'm glad he didn't quit because i've read about half of everything he's written which, uh, um, hey, like, like uh, I think it was Brenda mentioned that you just can't keep up with everything. <laughs> and some guys write faster than I can read. Yep. Um, so, uh, but anyway, but you're right there, Jack. Keep at it. That day will come when, uh, you know, not everybody sells the first submission they send out. Um, it, it, Okay, well, let's just a second here. There's something I have to do right now. Mm -hmm. neener, yes. Neener, neener. <laughs> <laughs> I have the buttons. Yeah. And Brenda, that was, you are that uh, success story that the first time you dip your finger into the pool, you know, it turns, it, it, you found success. But, you know, I've accumulated many, many rejection letters since then. So you can't, you know, it is actually part of the professional thing. Isaac Asimov got rejection letters at the end of his life, you know, and, you know, you know, he's one of the titans of, of, the, of the field. 
uh, they someone ran a statistic past me the other day. It said of a hundred people who want to be a writer, about three percent of them actually finish a manuscript. And of course, you can't sell anything until it's finished. Uh, so three percent actually finish, and of those a hundred writers, something like. Per 0.06 percent actually become published. So there's a winnowing that has to happen. But if you have what it takes, you uh, you can survive the winnowing process. And it's okay if you can't, because remember, three percent out of the hundred. If you well, if you just can't do it, you just can't do it. Okay. Well, what I used to tell people when they would ask is. That they would say, well, it's it's overwhelming. Um, yeah. Asimov's back in the day or Lightspeed or whoever, they're getting 500, 800 manuscripts a month. How can I compete with that? And I would, I would tell them, you're not competing with that. Especially, this is back before like electronic submissions. If you could just format your manuscript. Professionally. Professionally you know. and edit it and look for, you know, typos and all this stuff that actually would bump you up into the top 10 percent or so Absolutely. and then it, and then it, it, it's it's this process you're really competing with it what it, it's not that hard to get to into the top five percent of a magazine submission and then you just have to keep pushing at it um you're not competing with 800 manuscripts you're competing with the professionals who are sending stuff in and are probably going to get some sort of preferential look. And then you're competing with a relatively small number of people that are writing at a high level and haven't published yet. But you're not really competing with, you know, five or five or six hundred or eight hundred people. Most of those people will never submit another manuscript. Yep. They're in the 97 percent. Right. And it is, it's, it's, a, it's a very tiny percentage of people who ever really published professionally mm -hmm. more than more than a few times i know plenty of people do to, did a couple of short stories and then i whatever that i guess that satisfied the itch mm -hmm. but most professional writers who've, who have been at it for long enough it's the itch never goes away like you you might start off by saying if i could only sell a story to fnsf or something that would be you know that would satisfy me but it, it almost immediately doesn't and it's the same with novels. Or if only I could sell a novel to, you know, anybody, small press or something. And then if I need to have a I need to sell a novel to a, a big New York publisher. Then you do that, and then it's still not good enough. You 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 just want to keep it rolling. So, in order to get to that point, you're unlikely to be the type of person who will be satisfied, like with what you think you might be satisfied with initially. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's there's a lot of people, a lot of published writers, a lot of professionals. Most of them aren't making a living writing, but that's um, a separate hill to climb. That's a separate hill to climb, and you yeah, can't and get, frankly, can't I don't think we can count on that. that. It's a the yeah. number of J.K. Rowling's in the world is just not that large. Well, yeah, most 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 books I do, I read this recently will sell fewer than a thousand copies. Mm -hmm maybe not even 500 copies. So if you can sell 10,000 copies, your book is kind of successful. Mm -hmm. Heck, it's in that world, I think if you can sell 1,000 copies, you're being reasonably successful, especially in a lot of small press worlds. Mm -hmm. But uh, but what you were talking about, competition. <clears throat> we did an alternative apocalypse uh, volume here a while back, and we had 950 some odd submissions. And uh, I think you're absolutely correct because the people who, A, don't read the call, B, don't spell check their manuscript, and C, make their first sentence, uh, John Hughes, whose sister was Cicely Hughes, walked down the narrow hallway. And, you know, I mean, you just realize that, no, this, this is... Uh, this is a never gonna be, you know, you get through that first paragraph. And so once you get past that, you're in a much smaller club of people you're competing against. Like uh, Karen right now is uh, editing for me uh, uh, Alternative Truth, Southern Edition. And uh, 
bless their hearts. <clears throat> and she's having a fine time doing it, aren't you, Karen? Nod your head. I'm finding some amazing stories. Isn't that the yeah. fun part? Mm -hmm. I have actually started a new uh, call, but it's not open. It's just there where I am putting all of the stories that are so freaking good that just don't meet the call mm -hmm. that uh, I've got three open calls right now. And I damn near got enough stories collected in there to do its own uh, uh, anthology that are just, you know, the best the best that didn't fit you know mm -hmm. it's a yeah. great, it's fun doing this and for those of you who didn't know oh, I did, kitty. it's kitty time yeah. okay well so next week we're having tom mm -hmm. do, you, do you karen do you know remember who tom is bringing on i think he's bringing on blaze ward mm. who I think I think it's Blaze Ward and Michael Johnston, two of the really? hot space opera writers. Well, okay. Yeah, and Blaze, you know, Blaze. I don't know if he got the name Blaze because he's like a uh, comet. Comet, but he writes, he produces novel work at a pace that would make. Um, any any other writer I know look like a just a. Uh, Yawn, like me. Yes. You know, or like Jack, you said five years to do a novel. Mm -hmm. You know, Blaze would be saying, "Well, what? You've had five weeks. Come on, where is it?" <laughs> um, and uh, he's just that good, and uh, that is excellent. It's so good to have uh, somebody like Tom there, uh, bringing in some great talent. And uh, I appreciate uh, you guys here, uh, Brenda and. Um, Karen, yeah, that's you, Karen. Yeah, the Thank kitten you, lady. For uh, bringing us uh, Jack, because uh, Jack is, uh, it's always been a pleasure running into Jack at Rainforest and the like and the, the conventions. Are you going to be at Oricon? Uh, no, I couldn't be there. Oh. Well, I'll leave my chessboard at home. Okay, <laughs> give my regards to Nan, and uh, you guys take care and uh, uh, say goodbye to the kitten people. Yeah. Will do. Thanks so much for time. having me. Oh, it's always it's good and look forward to it again. It was a wonderful discussion, guys. You did great. It's great uh, to see you.